I hope that you brought a Bible with you, and if you did, that you will open it to the book of Joel. Um, You know where Joel is. It's right in between Hosea and Amos. We don't know where any of those books are. That's okay. That's why we chose a sermon series on the minor prophets. No shame today in using the the table of contents at the beginning of your Bible. Go find the book of Joel. And uh, I am particularly thankful, thankful as I've prepared this week that we are studying the minor prophets because I have been reminded of just how hard they are to understand. Now, I have been to seminary, I have some theological training, and I still get to the minor prophets, and I'm like, I don't know what that means. I'm going to need some help here. And so if you're like me, let's go on a journey together over the next two weeks of unpacking the book of Joel. I can't wait. I know this is going to be helpful to us. Um, One of the reasons that Joel is confusing is because of all the things that you imagine that the Bible might be about, you don't usually get to a book and think, this is going to be about bugs. Joel is about bugs. And I mean that literally. It's the Old Testament equivalent of the Pixar banger, A Bug's Life. You've seen that movie, right? 1999, Pixar dropped Toy Story, and we all wondered, can they do it again? And oh, yes, they can. And they did. They dropped A Bug's Life. Do you remember the villain in A Bug's Life? Anyone got his name on hand? Hopper. That's right. We got some Pixar fans over here. Shout out. He gave me the salute. He's like, I got you. Hopper, you know what's crazy? I'm pretty sure that the Pixar people were reading the book of Joel because the name Hopper is in the book. This is a book about bugs and it can be very confusing, but my mission today is to bring the complicated and sometimes historically far removed context of the book of Joel down to the bottom shelf so that together we can all understand it. Because what Caden reminded us of in the worship service is correct, that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever, which means that God has a perpetually relevant message in every corner of his word. There is no part of it that is irrelevant. There is no part of it that's out of touch. There's no, art of, there's no part of it that is out of date. All of it has a message for all of God's people for all of time. And today we're going to zoom in on the book of Joel and try to understand it together. Now, the book of Joel is about bugs. And what I mean by that is that the prophet Joel wrote in response to a, a, a disaster that befell the people of Israel in an invasion of locusts. So locusts are like little grasshoppers, except they eat all of the plants. And the nation of Israel was recently subject to a massive infestation, a massive invasion of locusts that was so devastating that it ate all of the crops in sight. And in a day and age where we are so accustomed to the grocery store, that means very little to us because we don't think about crops. But in an agrarian age, like the one in which the Bible was written, especially the Old Testament, if people didn't have successful crops, they didn't live. And so the descriptions are devastating with the reality that when the bugs came through in wave upon wave and year after year, and they consumed all of the vegetation, there was no food left for them to eat. There was no seeds left for them to plant. There was, no, there was nothing for them to feed their livestock. And so everything withered and shriveled and died. And it was a time of utter destitution in the land of Israel. And the prophet Joel is going to use this historical occasion as a wake-up call for the people of God to shake them out of their slumber and help them know how they should respond. It made me think of this this week. If you've ever seen these signs posted in public that say, in case of emergency, do this. Have you ever seen those? In case of emergency, maybe you can fill these in with me with a loud voice. I need 100% participation here. In case of emergency, break glass. glass. Great job, class. Smallest service, but loudest participation. I appreciate you, Noon. You're with me, keeping me going in the afternoon here. Uh, How about this one? In case of emergency, call 911. Exactly, we got it. If something happens, we will will break all the glass and call all the 911s. We'll we'll be okay in in the case of a calamity. That's, that's, the instructions are written so that if the worst case happens, if disaster descends, if everything goes crazy, just do this. And that's exactly what the book of Joel is like. Because in the nation of Israel, the worst has happened. It is the case of emergency. And Joel is saying, in the case of this emergency, do this. 
And what we're going to see is that the, the response that the, the prophet Joel advocates for in the people then is still the response that we should have now when disaster strikes. And that's, in fact, the big idea for this message. It's this, disaster drives God's people to a decisive spiritual response. In God's economy, nothing is wasted. God is the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth, and he uses every single circumstance for the good of his people, even disastrous ones. And the disaster that befell the nation of Israel in this invasion of locusts is used by God through the prophet Joel as a, as a, a motivation for the people of God to decisively and spiritually respond, for them to wake up and to look out and to run back. And that's what we're gonna see, that their response needs to be our response when disaster strikes. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna read for you the first half of the book of Joel. We're gonna go all the way from chapter one, verse one, to chapter two, verse 17. So I need you to hang in with me because this is a long reading, but we're doing it on purpose. And I'm gonna give you some commentary along the way, and I wanna give you a framework before I read. What you need to know is that all of chapter one is Joel looking back on the past, what has happened through the invasion of these locusts and the devastation that they left behind. Then the first part of chapter two is him looking forward to something he's gonna call the day of the Lord. And then the, the very end, or the, it's about the middle of chapter two, verses 12 to 17, he's gone from the past in the locusts to the future in the day of the Lord. And then in those verses, he gives a call to repentance and restoration in the here and now. So I'm gonna read quite a long section for us. If you brought a Bible, put your eyes down on the page. If you didn't bring a Bible, the words will be on the screen. But in any case, I'm gonna read this long section and I'll give you some comments as we go so that you can know where you're at and what's going on. Joel chapter one, verse one. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And we don't know anything about Joel. We don't actually know exactly even when this was written or when this locust plague took place. We just know he was the son of Pethuel and we know that this is what he recorded for God's people. Verse two. Hear this, you elders. Give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. This was so shocking and unique that they didn't know anything that had happened in the past that was like this. And they were told to even tell their children about it. And this is the description that we get in verse four. What the cutting locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. So it describes wave upon wave upon wave. And the bugs came through and they ate everything. And it was like there was nothing left. But just in case another wave came through and ate all that the first wave left behind. And again and again and again until they had absolutely nothing. And then Joel turns and he's going to talk here in the coming verses to different groups of people. And he's calling them to respond based on this calamity. Verse five, awake you drunkards and weep and wail all you drinkers of wine because of the sweet wine for it is cut off from your mouth. We're gonna see a theme here. If there's no grapes, there's no wine to drink. So he says, hey, all of you who are so used to so many grapes that you can get drunk on all of the wine, you better wake up because there is no more vine and there will be no more wine to drink. Verse six, for a nation is a poetic description of the bugs, has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. This is a big theme here, that if there's no grain, there can be no grain offering to the Lord. If there's no grapes, there can be no drink offering to the Lord. They are so destitute that they can't even bring the gifts of worship to the one true and living God that they're intended to as his covenant people. Verse 10, the fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. 
Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because, of the, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and it's not just the trees, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Verse 13, now a call to the religious class, to the priests and the ministers. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them, even the flocks of sheep suffer. It was so bad that there was nothing to feed the animals, and so they would go out to pasture, and there would be nothing there for them to eat. Verse 19, to you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Now in chapter 2, he's going to look forward, no longer to an invasion of bugs, but to a foreign invading army. And that is going to be a sign of what he calls the day of the Lord. And he begins with this warning. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. This is a description of what this army will do to God's land, and this is quite a poetic one. He says the land is like the Garden of Eden before them. It's green, it's luscious, it's fruitful, but behind them like a desolate wilderness. That's what they leave in their wake. They burn and destroy and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale, like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. This is what they do. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They, They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. They take everything over. And then verse 10, the earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. Verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. For he who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? And now he's going to issue a call to repentance and restoration in the here and now. Verse 12, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather all the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations." 
Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Some easy Bible reading for you this morning. <laughs> Disaster, which is, what, which is what they experienced in the invasion of the locusts. Disaster. What it does is it drives God's people to a decisive spiritual response. So despite the fact that the disaster for us in the here and now may not be bugs, it may be something else. The disaster may be a cancer diagnosis. It may be a car accident. It may be a lost job or a lost loved one. But whatever it is that befalls us, God intends disaster to wake us up to some spiritual realities and to call us back to him, to have a decisive, that means an obvious, an actionable spiritual response that actually changes us. And through this text, I just want to show you, want to review some of the parts of it. And, and through doing that, I want to show you three elements of this decisive spiritual response that Joel exhorted the original hearers to, and that we still today can participate in, in times of disaster. So when disaster strikes, what do we do? How do we respond? Well, when disaster strikes, number one, God's people wake up. God's people wake up. The book of Joel is not clear in the ways that some of the other prophets are clear about the sin that prompted this act of judgment from God, but there was sin, no doubt. Because what we're going to see here is that the reason that God is bringing the bugs to the nation of Israel is as, a, is as an expression of their disobedience and their violation of his covenant. In fact, when you read all about bugs, this, what it would have brought to mind for the original hearers was it would have been like an echo of the Exodus. You remember when the people of Israel were enslaved in the nation of Egypt and God miraculously showed up with judgment for salvation and he brought 10 plagues against the Egypt and one of them was locusts. One of them was bugs. And so you can imagine that as the people of God are having these swarming bugs devastate their land, they're thinking to themselves, God used bugs against our enemies and now God has brought bugs to us. And what it would have done is rattle them out of their spiritual complacency that they had obviously been lulled into. No longer faithfully worshiping their covenant-keeping God, but slipping into idol worship and disobedience to the law. And God is using this to shake them, to rattle them awake. I wonder if you've ever been in a scenario where you were kind of sleepy and then all of a sudden you were very awake. When I was in college, I stayed with my, uh, I, was, I was staying with my friend at his place, at his parents' house, and his parents had gone on a trip, so it was just the two of us. I pulled into his house late one night, and it turned out, I didn't know this at the time, but the police were looking for a car that matched the description of my car. I hadn't done anything wrong. I'm not a criminal, I promise, but I, I just pulled, I pulled into the house. I go in the house, and my buddy was like already asleep in his room. I go to my room, and just like a couple minutes later, the dog starts kind of like yipping and barking at the front door. And so my buddy kind of like groggily, he gets out of his, he gets out of his uh, bedroom, and he comes, he comes to the door where the dog is, and he's like, what, what's going on? What are, you, what are you concerned about? And then all of a sudden, through the glass in the door, the beam of a flashlight and a loud voice that says, Police! <laughs> So you can bet he went from like a little groggy to very conscious, like immediately. Have you ever had that? You're, you're laying in bed at night and you're sleeping, you're slumbering, and all of a sudden something goes bump in the night out in the living room and you sit up and you feel that feeling of like adrenaline. Like what's, because you know, I got to, I got to be ready for action. I got to be ready for what is coming. And this is the spiritual effect that disaster should have on God's people. It wakes us up and makes us alert because it is so easy in our lives to grow complacent, to grow numb to what matters most, to be so distracted on things that are temporal and superficial, to drift away from God. And sometimes it takes a calamity. Sometimes it takes a difficulty. Sometimes it takes a tragedy for us to be rattled out of our slumber and for God to say, wake up. Be aware again of what matters most. It's not these little things that you are worried about. It is your relationship with the creator God who made you. And sometimes God is kind enough to use disaster to rattle us out of our sleep. 
And Joel was hoping that the locust invasion would be that for the people of God. He would say, wake up. Don't you see that these bugs are coming from God because we're living in disobedience? You need to stop slumbering. You need to be conscious. You need to be alert. You need to be spiritually aware of what God intends to do in this day. Now, what do we do if, if we're going to get a spiritual wake-up call like this? What, what should we do? What will it look like? Well, first, we, we should hear. We should hear. We need to open our ears. One of the hallmarks of spiritual slumber and spiritual complacency is that we grow increasingly deaf to what God says. We're off on our own path, we're doing our own thing, we're drifting away from God, and all the while God is speaking to us through his people and through his word, and yet we grow increasingly more, we grow increasingly deaf. We can't hear him, we ignore him, we we stop listening. And verse two, it begins in Joel chapter one, it says, hear this, you elders, and give ear all inhabitants of the land. This is Joel saying, listen up. Unstop, unplug your ears and listen again to the word of God. This is what we need when we have disaster that functions like a wake up call for us is we need to listen again to the word of God, to what it says, what he wants to speak to us. Then not only do we hear, but we should lament. We should lament. I think sometimes we fall victim to this idea that Christianity needs to be like a plastic optimism that just pretends like everything's okay. Because we know, which is a theological fact, that the end of the story ends in our good with resurrection power and the restoration of all things and the establishment of the kingdom of God, that does not mean that we don't pretend like it doesn't hurt right now. Like things aren't wrong right now. Like things aren't worthy of our grief and our lamentation and our weeping and our wailing. They are. And if we're going to be awake spiritually, we have to feel appropriately the weight of sorrow for the brokenness of sin in the world. As a follower of Jesus who's spiritually awake, you cannot help but look at sin in my life and in the world and all of the devastating effects that it has brought because the cosmos has been fractured through rebellion against the one who made it and the result is wickedness and evil and injustice and pain. And so what do we do? Well, we do what Joel told all these people to do. We weep and we wail and we mourn. We lament before God. We feel the weight of just how broken things are. And we don't, we don't even just feel it as some sort of like out there exterior problem. Like, wow, the world is so broken, but but I'm so broken. I'm part of the brokenness in this world. And all of the pain and all of the wickedness and all of the injustice is connected to the same sin problem that lives in my heart. We lament it. We weep over it. We feel the weight of grief and sorrow because of sin. The reality is that all of the evil and brokenness in the world is because of sin, all of it. Now hear me, what I'm not saying is that if you get cancer, it's because you have sinned and God is punishing you. But I am saying that cancer exists because sin exists. Genesis 3 tells us about this, that when mankind rebelled against God, it's like the cosmos was was broken somehow. Romans chapter 8 says that all of creation groans as it awaits redemption. Here's a couple things you need to be aware of. Number one, that that brokenness in the world, all of it is a result of sin. But secondarily, you need to be aware that if you are in Christ, no disaster that you face is punishment from God. None of it. The Bible does delineate a difference between punishment and discipline. Punishment is the righteous wrath that you deserve for your sin, and discipline is the loving instruction of God to sons and daughters to make them more like Jesus. Sin and brokenness is in the world because of rebellion in which we participate, and yet if we are in Christ, we can know that none of the calamity that we face is punishment from God, and yet we, we mourn it. 
we weep, we lament, whether it is cancer or a tsunami or a shooting or a car accident, the brokenness of the world should lead God's people to grief. But then not to stop at grief, to take our grief into this, into worship. Worship is not always just uh, triumphant, joyful, happy-go-lucky expressions of thanks to God. Sometimes worship is tear-stained worship. That's why a whole bunch of your psalms are called psalms of lament because you can worship God in the sorrow. And that's what the people in the book of Joel are called to do. They're, They're called multiple times. If you look at verse 14 of chapter one, it says this, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to him. This is what they're instructed to do. They're instructed to listen to the word of God, to lament the brokenness of the world, and then to cry out to God, to worship him in the grief and in the sorrow and in the pain, to fast and to pray and to seek the face of God. This sometimes is what disaster pushes us to do. And when it does, it is a gracious gift from God because it wakes us up from the silly and temporary and superficial things that we're pursuing. And God says, come to me, seek me, worship me. And so we run to him as we listen to his word and as we lament brokenness in the world. Disaster drives God's people to a decisive spiritual response. And the first response is that God's people wake up when disaster strikes. The second response is this, when disaster strikes, God's people look out. God's people wake up and God's people look out. We chose that phrase, look out, because it's exactly the kind of thing that Joel is trying to get the people to feel and to respond to. Because look out is something that we say, right? If we're walking with somebody and they're about to, they're about to trip over something large, we say, look out. If someone is in the middle of the road and a car is hurtling down that road and we know that danger is about to be upon them, we say, look out. We say, watch out, heads up. And when we say that, what we're trying to do is make people aware that they need to lift their attention off of whatever they're looking at and look at the danger that is coming. Look out. And that's exactly what the first 11 verses of chapter two in the book of Joel are intended to do for God's people. It's like the prophet Joel saying, look out everyone. Because what he does here is he turns from the past tense description of the locusts to a future tense description of an invading army. And he is telling, he's telling the people of God, you need to look out for this. He, he tells them first that the day of the Lord, which is what this little section is all about. It's what the whole book of Joel is about, the day of the Lord. He says, the day of the Lord is approaching. If you look at verse one of chapter two, it says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. The day of the Lord. This is a huge theme in the book of Joel. And oftentimes when I've read this, I've thought of the day of the Lord as like a future 24 hour period in which God will pour out his wrath on the world. And there, there are elements of that that are true, but What becomes really clear as you study the book of Joel is that the day of the Lord is not just a future occurrence and it's not just a 24 hour period. The day of the Lord is a time when God shows up to judge and to save. And there are multiple expressions of the day of the Lord that the people of God experience. So Joel is saying, hey, these bugs that invaded, this was like an inauguration of the day of the Lord. This is an expression of the day of the Lord. But he also says, you need to look out because coming in the future is a far more severe expression of the day of the Lord. The reason that we know that is because there's this place in Deuteronomy 28 that kind of forms this foundation for all that we're reading in the book of Joel when the people of God were rescued from from Egypt in slavery, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and then they stood on the edge of the promised land. 
And Deuteronomy is the telling of the law to the people who are about to go into the promised land. That's, it means second law. It's the retelling of the law. And in Deuteronomy 28, God, through Moses, stands in front of the people and he says to them, I am going to set before you death and life, and you can choose. He's, he's re-upping on the covenant with them, and he's saying, I am a covenant-keeping God. And so here's what I put before you today. I will place before you the covenant that if you keep it, I will bless you. And if you violate it, I will curse you. And that description is extensive. But he places it before the people, and he says to them, obey the covenant, be faithful to God, and I will lavish blessing upon you. Your land will be fruitful, and you will multiply, and you will be safe and secure. But if you choose to walk away from me, if you choose to disobey me, if you choose to dishonor the law and break the covenant, then there will be curses. And if you go read Deuteronomy 28, through verses like 30 to 45, you will read the description of some of the curses that are explicitly what the people of God experienced in the day of Joel. Deuteronomy 28 actually says, if you disobey the covenant, locusts will come and eat all of the plants and the vine will dry up and the oil will be gone and the livestock will die. But unfortunately, the description doesn't end there. It goes on to say that what will ultimately happen is that a foreign army will come as an expression of the judgment of God and will invade his people and ransack their city and send them into exile. That was what was coming for God's people if they violated his covenant. And we're seeing that as it approaches. Joel is warning them and he's saying, look out. Because not only is the day of the Lord approaching, but He tells us kind of as a bookend in verse one, he says, the day of the Lord is coming. And then verses two through basically like verse nine, he's describing this army that will come in as as an expression of God's judgment. And then in verse 10, he uses this apocalyptic language. This is like the end of the world. The earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. And then verse 11 says, the Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. And then he finishes here, for the day of the Lord is great and awesome. Who can endure it? Now, the usage of that word awesome is a little different than we normally just colloquially use that word. You know, we eat in and out and we're like, that was awesome. (laughs) <laughs> this is like this is like tremble before God in awe kind of awesome the day of the Lord other translations say it is great and dreadful the day of the Lord is great and terrible who can endure it and what he's saying there is this that this army coming is not is not even in itself the thing that we should be afraid of. The thing that we should truly fear, the thing that we should tremble before is that God's wrath is coming against sin. And that is a sobering but a necessary message that the, the prophet Joel brought to his people and a message that we need today. That we serve a holy God who is righteously angry with sin and who will judge it justly with his wrath. That's what the day of the Lord represents. And Joel is standing before the people of God and it's as if he's pleading with them and he's saying something like this. If this is how devastated you were by the bugs of the field, how do you think you will fare against the God of heaven? the reality that we need to be aware of and feel is that every single one of us is born in rebellion against God. We are sinful by nature and by choice. And so by our natural disposition and by our action, we stand on the opposing side of a holy God. 
And the book of Joel would say to you today, you do not want to stay there. Because when God comes in his wrath against sin, you don't want to be left in opposition to him. Look out. We're supposed to feel the weight of this. We're supposed to sense the heaviness of this message and feel the reality that I am a sinner and I stand condemned before a holy God who is, will be righteously furious toward all sin and evil as he should be, as the just judge of all of creation. We need to feel that. Now, you might be thinking to yourself at this moment, why did I come to church today? <laughs> You know, I've had a hard week. I was here for some encouragement. And you're not doing the trick, Nick. If you could, like, turn the corner to some chicken soup for the soul, like, just help me out here. This is hard. Like, it's, it's, it's depressing. It's devastating. But, but it needs to be. And here's why. Because we, we love sometimes to try to conceive of a God. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. Conceive of a God who is all love and no wrath but that's not God. Like, that is a figment of your imagination. That is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is uncontainably holy. And the the Bible speaks over and over and over again about his wrath. But here's the best news in all the world, and this is why you came to church this morning. It does get encouraging, I promise. Because until you feel the weight of, and the dread of the wrath of God, you can never fully appreciate the love and mercy of God. You cannot. I've heard it said many times before, until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. We first have to grieve and mourn and feel the weight of sin and the just condemnation that it deserves if the glory of salvation will ever break upon our hearts. I mean, think about it. A wrathless God produces a meaningless gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is news of salvation for sinful people. (laughs) And what we're about to be invited to in, in the next section of the text is we're about to be invited into the life and forgiveness and restoration that only God can give. But until we, until we come face to face with the devastation of the wrath of God, we will never run to the mercy of God. If God has no wrath, then what do we need to be saved from? If God has no wrath, then what is the cross of Jesus Christ for? I'll tell you what it's for. It's so that God can be perfectly just and also totally merciful to his people. God pours out his wrath on Jesus Christ so that sinners like you and me do not have to experience it for ourselves. This is the best news in the world that wrath is not inevitable. And the reason God tells you about wrath is not so that he can be like an angry, violent, vindictive, fire and brimstone preacher. He tells you about his wrath so that you can escape it. He tells you about his wrath and then he commands you to repent so that you can receive mercy instead. It is the most loving thing that God could do to tell you about the severity of his wrath and then to give you the way of escape through repentance. It's the most loving thing God could do. We get it twisted when we think, oh, any preaching that talks about repentance is not loving. It is the most loving thing that God can do to invite you not to walk down the path of death, but to turn around and walk down the path of life. This is what God gives to his people in the book of Joel. And so the third decisive spiritual action is this. When disaster strikes, God's people run back. God's people run back to God. They wake up, they look out, and they run back. They run to God. This is after feeling the weight and sorrow and fear of God's wrath against sin. This is the relief of the good news that there is a way to receive mercy. But the road that you must walk is the road of repentance. And this is, this is what we're invited into here is a turning that's what repentance means. 
And if we are going to be awake spiritually, and if we are going to look out for the wrath of God, the, the inevitable conclusion will be that we will turn from a life of sin and we will turn towards God in faith and obedience. Chapter 2, verse 12. Yet, even now. <laughs> How gracious of God. Yet, even now. After all of your complacency, after all of your sin, after all of your rebellion, after all of your neglect, even now, declares Yahweh, return to me. Return to me. How good of God that he waits patiently for his wayward people to come home. He invites them to himself. He says, you don't, you don't have to experience death and condemnation and bondage and guilt and shame anymore. Even now, you can come to me. This is, this is the God to whom we run. A God who he's going to tell us in the next couple of verses is compassionate. He is gracious, he is merciful, he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He quotes Exodus 34 where God explains who he is to Moses. This is the character of God. Not a God who is quick to anger, a God who is slow to anger. Not a God who delights to show his wrath, a God who delights to show mercy. This is the God to whom we run. So often when disaster strikes, we don't run to God, we run to ourselves. We try, to, we try to fix it with problem solving. We try to numb it with substances. We try to avoid it with distraction. And all along, God is saying, come to me. Come to me. I am compassionate. I am gracious. I am slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Run to God and then run to God with all of your heart. You see that there? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And then this, that word rend means tear. And tear your hearts, not your garments. You know the, the really famous external expression of repentance where people would tear their outer garments and they would sit in sackcloth and ashes as a sign of repentance. And God is saying, what I care most about is not your external conformity to a set of religious rules, what I care most about is your, the inward state of your soul. I care that all of you, to the very core, is broken over sin, knows that you need me, and is running to me. Return to me with all of your heart, with all of who you are. And the, the promise of God, should we run to him with all of our heart in repentance, is that we will receive grace and mercy in our time of need. And so, yes, this is, this is a heavy message. Trust me, I know this is the third time I've preached it. <laughs> this is a heavy message, but it is a me it's a message that ends in God's grace. There's a, a place in the Bible that is equally heavy, but it sings in perfect harmony with this. It's in Luke chapter 13. I would encourage you this week, if you have a chance to maybe go study it. Jesus is confronted by this group of people and they come to him and they say, they tell him about a recent uh, travesty that was perpetuated by, uh, that was perpetrated by Pilate. He goes, goes to Jesus and they say, hey, there's this group of people and he, they say, Pilate mingled the worshiper's blood with their sacrifices, which means this, there was a group of Jewish people worshiping and Pilate, like the Roman authorities, came in and slaughtered those people and mingled their blood with the animals that they were sacrificing for their sin. This was like an abhorrent, heinous act of evil. And these people go to Jesus and they say, how are you going to respond to this? Like, what do you have to say to this? And his response is not like what you would expect. One of the things that he does is he actually, he brings up another tragedy so that is what we might call a moral evil because it was perpetrated by evil men. But he brings up another tragedy that we might call like a natural disaster or natural evil. He brings up an instance in which 18 people were killed because a tower fell over and they were crushed by it. And his response to whether people were murdered unjustly or people were killed by this like natural accident, 
his response to both is the same to the people who are standing in front of him. And he basically says this, you should not think that those people, either who were murdered or who were killed by the tower, you should not think that they were any more sinful than you are. Which is his way of saying, you need to be aware when you respond to evil in the world of your sinfulness and your weakness. And then he says this, which is even more jarring because he doesn't offer any comfort. He doesn't offer, man, that was really evil. He says this, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Which is Jesus's way of saying this. Unless you come to a realization of your own sinfulness and run to God as a result of it, you will perish, not because you'll be murdered by Pilate or crushed by a tower, you will perish before the wrath of God. And so he says, repent. He says, come to me, turn away from your life of sin. And my favorite thing about that is the reality that the the one who said those words in the face of those tragedies, the one who said those words is not some sort of uncaring, unkind, vindictive, distant deity. It is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood for the forgiveness of sinners like you and me. And so his invitation to repentance is an invitation to eternal life and to forgiveness and to restoration. This is the message that we all need, that disaster, when it strikes, it drives God's people to a decisive spiritual response, that we are shaken out of our slumber, that we wake up, that we look out and we pay attention to the coming wrath of God and we run back to the Lord in repentance to experience his mercy. It was the message that the people in Joel's day needed and it is a message that we need today. Let us together decisively, spiritually respond to God and receive the restoration that only he can give. Let's pray.